guess we'll just start because the room is full, doors are closed. I'm still five minutes early, but I'm pretty sure we'll can fill up the schedule. Any non-Dutch people here? A couple, so I'll, st I'll stick to English. Um, so uh, I, I'm Jan de Vries, a cloud solution architect at, uh, at Fortinet, which actually means I get to do a lot of stuff uh, within Azure, uh, creating cloud solutions and, and stuff like this. Doing microservices, of course, because we're all doing this. Uh, and today I'm here to tell you, you might not want to do microservices, or at least, well, maybe not. Um, also my Twitter handle, if you want to reach out or something. Uh, so a uh, fir first question I have for you is, uh, is how big are your teams actually? Because uh, are there any, uh, any uh, people in this room who has a development uh, uh, environment with like 100 plus people? No, most, well, one. Well, okay, you're the exception today. Uh, but I guess most of us work in teams uh, with less than 100 people, and this is true for, well, a lot of organizations. Most of the time you have about 50 or less developers and a couple of testers and product owners and yada, yada, yada. Do you actually need microservices in such an environment? Because microservices are hard and yeah, sure, it's, it's easy to expand your uh, overall solution. It's easy to, well, create new, uh, new stuff and, and, and scale infinitely, or at least that's, that's a theory. And you can also do different programming languages, different styles of software uh, architecture. But do you want this? If you only have a, couple, a handful of developers, you all need to maintain each and every service which is doing, well, uh, its thing. Uh, but you all have to keep up to date with the latest uh, Onion architecture uh, stuff, N layer. Uh, you want to, uh, you want to uh, maintain your knowledge about Node.js, about C Sharp, about, well, each and every language which your microservices are maybe written in. So that's, that's hard. And most of the time you don't have to do this inside a monolith solution because that's just, well, one big solution. And most of the time the software design is the same in this solution because, well, that's what we're doing for decades now. And well, it, it works most of the time. Also, this big monolith will probably s stand the test of time. It, it's stronger as water. It's stronger as, as your mind, it's stronger as your will, uh, because it's there and it's never moving, it's just doing its own little thing. Compared to a microservices solution, which is, well, uh, if, if done wrong, it could be a bit flaky. If something happens, if there's some wind, maybe some of these stones, some of these services will fall down and your whole application is, well, uh, isn't working anymore. So that, that's hard. That's the hard part of a microservice solution, if done wrong, of course. So, and, and what a lot of people say, if you have a monolith, you can just extract your logic from it and s uh, put it inside a new small service and, well, it's a microservice now. Well, in reality, this looks pretty much the same as a monolith which is being uh, pulled out, uh, where microservices are pulled out. Because at some time, your monolith solution will fall down and your microservices aren't doing anything anymore because their main solution, their main, well, thing they're dependent upon isn't there anymore either. But that's, of course, in a, in a monolith solution like we know for, well, uh, a couple of decades now. Uh, because those monoliths are done wrong. I think we can all agree on this. That's the, the main hate point for monoliths. But the same goes for microservices. If, if done wrong, it's, well, actually more pain uh, and, and less uh, the gain. So what should you do? Well, you should design your monolith and also your microservices like a silo. 
Each silo does its own little thing. It's responsible for its own little thing. And, well, we just uh, gotten used to not working in silos anymore, but that's just a, the team's part of it. We don't want a development team silo or a team A silo, team B silo. But in the technology stack, you still want this, or at least it makes sense in my opinion. And, well, that, and my opinion is based on the experience I have with the past couple of projects uh, I, I've uh, run. Uh, a while back, that's uh, a nice, nice story. A while back, I came at a customer doing a quick scan. We're doing quick scans like a consultant comes into a company, looks at your solution, and has some annotations on it, like what could be better and what not. So did this company uh, hired me for a day and, uh, hey, Jan, uh, we have a Microsoft solution. Could you review it and, and tell us it's, it's uh, thumbs up? Well, I got there, and after doing some investigation, their Microsoft solution looked a bit like this. It was very, very evil. <laughs> because what they had done is having exposed, with, of course, a lot of layers and interaction, uh, having exposed all of the tables as a service in their solution. Which makes sense if you want your solution to be slow and you want to sell performance as a feature. But most of the time, uh, this isn't a good idea because this is, well, all of the services are intertwined with each other. If you want to have customer data, you also want to do an inner join for persons, probably. Uh, so that's what you do in SQL. But now you have to do a REST call to the customer service and also a call to the person service. Or this customer service is doing it for you because that's easier. Because somewhere along the lines you've heard you need to use few models and few models aren't the same as entities. So this, this was rather evil and I didn't know how to put this to this customer aside from uh, telling it telling them is what this was a suboptimal solution. <laughs> so I can't take credit for this, but something I, I can take credit for, which was also wrong, is something we did at a project I was involved in. Uh, and at the time we thought, well, we're doing microservices because our services are rather small and doing their own little thing. But what we actually did is indeed have a couple of small services doing their own little thing, but they were dependent upon one big ball of data called SQL Server and, well, one SQL database. And sharing a database, a single database between multiple services <coughs> is a bad idea. Because what you've actually done is create a distributed monolith, which means a monolith with additional latency and risk of stuff getting down. So that's why I actually like monoliths because they have zero latency. Everything is done in memory, or at least a lot of stuff is done in memory. Even the communication between these services are done well in, in the memory and in, in the runtime and not via network. Of course, some nuances uh, can be applied to this statement, but uh, that's a different uh, talk. So how did this look like in the physio diagram? Because I'm an architect, I need to use physio and, and draw lines. Uh, so what we had is we had created a couple of APIs, but not only our own APIs. We had uh, also SharePoint and SAP and well, a, a couple of other services which we were using. And a lot of the data was stored in this shared SQL database, customer data. And of course, every, every solution nowadays needs an identity server. So we had an API on the identity, so we were doing secure stuff. Some, some, time, went, some time went by and this was okay-ish, it worked. And especially on premises this worked. Once we got to the cloud, we needed to add some retrying logic and transient error handling, of course, but because the cloud. Uh, but after some time, we had a couple of vendors, and they wanted to uh, work with our data, with our customer data, which makes sense because the data we have 
is quite valuable as and some parties will be able to do more business with it. So what we did is we created a public business API where vendors and other integration partners can connect to. Of course, we knew uh, this might be something valuable uh, we want to uh, uh, expose to multiple parties, multiple services of our own. So instead of doing a lot of logic inside this business API, we also create an integration service, an integration API, because everything is an API nowadays. Uh, so an integration API, and what this did, what this service did, is doing some routing, some some BizTalk stuff, so retrieving data, uh, routing data, and and aggregating it. So if I want to have a customer, this integration API went to all different systems like SharePoint, SAP, or customer database stuff like this, retrieve the data, and send the DTO to the public business API which in its turn sends the, the appropriate object to our vendor or integration partner. <coughs> so this works and we were quite happy with ourselves because we had a lot of small or we had a couple of small services doing their own little thing and we thought they didn't have, well, we thought this was the way to go. Then uh, we noticed some of the vendors were so happy with our service, they were like DDoSing our public business API and accessing data which they, well, uh, which we want to ha receive some extra money for. So what we did is we created a new business management API where we could say vendor X can only do 10,000 requests per day and vendor Y can do 20,000. Cool. We were smart enough to notice, well, this is, this is not actually customer data. It's, it's our, well, business API management. So we're just creating a new SQL database. So this is easy in Azure. If it was on-premises, we would probably store it inside the same SQL server or same uh, database. But now, with the power of the cloud, we didn't. Uh, so we separated uh, these concerns. Being good Boy Scouts as we, uh, as we are, uh, we want to extend some functionality uh, uh, on our system, and we could do this in some service living, well, in, in this side of the drawing. But what we actually said, well, uh, we have this public uh, business API now, so uh, vendors are hooking into this. So what we can do is also leverage the power of this API and if we fail to do something, probably our vendors and integration partners are failing to do this also. So by dogfooding our, our own API, uh, our idea was to uh, notice the, the failures of our API and improve it over time. Makes sense. So what we did, uh, we had to retrieve some data from a, from a public company and do some parsing on this data because it was rather dirty. And afterwards, after this data was parsed in, in a format we could understand, we needed to send it to the business API. So these are three different steps. And having read uh, some uh, blog posts about uh, microservices, we thought, well, three different things which need to happen. Uh, we need three different services. One service to actually retrieve the data, store it inside some repository like SQL Server, which is a design decision, which is, well, not optimal, but we did. And what we did is send a message to our parsing API, which then in its turn retrieved the document from uh, the database, did some parsing on it, stored it back again inside SQL Server in a new, in a different uh, table, of course, and sent a message to the processing API, which in its turn retrieved all of the records from the SQL server and sent it one by one to our public business API. At the time when we were running a test, we were quite happy with ourselves because yay, we were doing microservices, or at least that's what we thought at the time. And it was running fine-ish until you start to notice what we actually did is create 
well, a distributed monolith, like I mentioned, we were sharing a database. And all of this stuff, what we were doing, could be done inside one service because it's only doing one functional thingy. Because what happens in, if, well, if this process API, for example, f is failing for some reason because it's a cloud and stuff fail all the time. If this one is failing, the parse API will also uh, have an exception. So either you have to catch it or it bubbles up to the web job, which was in, uh, responsible for, uh, well, retrieving data. But if the processing API is failing, it's bubbling all the way up to the, to the web job. So, uh, not a very ideal design. The parse is, uh, is uh, erroring out, but uh, the results are being written to the SQL server, I think. That's the error down. Sure. So, how does uh, the parse AP error out? And this uh, thing is the process AP is uh, giving an error. Good question. Uh, I'll repeat it. So, the, the question is, how come the parse API and, and the web job API are failing because the process API is, if, is giving some kind of an error? Uh, normally, if you would solve this asynchronous, it wouldn't. But of course, we did an HTTP call to uh, the different API, and then if it fails, we had to catch it somehow. Uh, so that was a different uh, design fault uh, we had. Uh, but that, that's easy solvable, of course, yeah. So a lot of design flaws. Uh, one, other, one other thing which uh, we, no we noticed, which was happening more and more often because, uh, well, our public business API became more popular, is if the integration API for some reason was failing of the retrieving data, and if you're working with, well, backend systems, uh, it, can, it can fail from time to time. What we now had because of multiple design flaws is if this failing, all of these services were failing also. And this is just a simplified diagram because this integration API was used for multiple services, of course. So if this one was failing, our whole solution was, well, yeah, cascading, uh, cascading errors. So of course, uh, we didn't actually have such a solution, but it's a, fi it's a nice visual uh, touch to it because we didn't make this many design flaws in our solution, of course, but it's just visual. So we didn't, uh, we didn't have one small, well, one small distributed monolith. We had a very big distributed monolith. All of our services were some way dependent upon the integration API. Some weren't because they were doing only a postal code check, so you need don't they were uh, they were calling HTTP uh, to to postal code checks .nl or something. Uh, but but all of these services were inside a big monolith, so distributed monolith, so rather slow. One other problem uh, in this design is is the logging. Logging is quite hard when you have a distributed system. I don't think red is quite readable. Uh, but what this states, what just appeared for the people in the back, we, uh, I've, I have login group one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, and I think this is familiar to most of your solutions nowadays. Uh, if there's an HTTP call to your API, you start a, a log group or something, uh, which you can correlate uh, logging events to, so you can track how a user has used your well uh, service, how, how a request went uh, inside your service. What happens if you make multiple HTTP calls or multiple requests inside your system? A new logging group is uh, being created each and every time when the request hits your service. Now, there are probably some smart people in this room who say, well, Jan, we've solved this with uh, providing a correlation ID in our message, and, or a login group ID in our message, and sending it along the lines. Because, well, we had this problem, and this solved it. And it actually does solve this. But it's a design flaw, in my opinion. It's, 
if you need to send a correlation ID to different services in order to track how a message is uh, handled inside your solution, it's a major design flaw because that's just stuff you don't need for your functional uh, process and you're adding it to your messages, which is, well, just plain stupid in my opinion because this is a, well, this isn't what you want. It's clutter in your message. It doesn't have anything anything to do with your functional with your functional uh, uh, business uh, value which you're trying to uh, solve. How does it look like in your logging ta table? Well, a bit like this because everything is asynchronous, of course, uh, but you can't correlate anything uh, for logging groups with each other because who knows if uh, logging group two belongs to logging group one or maybe four or whatever. You can do some, some magic with, with the date times, of course, uh, but that's not very, uh, well, that's not a very uh, good solution because you might have like 30 million log, uh, log uh, lines per day and going through them and trying to match them with each other based on a timestamp if you have multiple users is not very useful. With this, this, you'll solve this with the correlation ID, but that's just a bad practice in my opinion. If you need it for this stuff, of course. Correlation IDs still have value, but not for logging in my opinion. So what should you do? Well, segregate uh, your uh, business logic, uh, uh, segregate your business logic. Like I mentioned, doing silos, each functional thing you want to do, if you need to provide some business value, you put it in a service and it does its own thing and isn't dependent on other services. So how does this, uh, how does this look like? Well, let's take for example a web shop. I'm not a web shop expert, but I can imagine a web shop needs to have some checkout system, some inventory system, and you need to do some searching uh, on it in order to find products. So all of these services are their own little microservices, microservice, their own little module inside a monolith, depending on what you're creating. And they're not talking with each other, they're talking with an event bus, a message bus, whatever you want. Uh, and if, if you need to share some data between these services, this is done via the message bus in order to well share the data because uh, the inventory system does want to know if someone checks out something because you'd have to do a minus one of the product in the inventory and something has to be shipped. So this, uh, this has to be sent to a shipping service probably. So there are of course, uh, there is of course state which you need to share between these services. It's just not the checkout service isn't calling the inventory service because they shouldn't have a dependency with each other. When going the microservices route, you also have uh, the possibility of choosing a different kind of repository if you want to. It might make sense to have a Cosmos DB or a Document DB for a checkout service or for an inventory service, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a web shop expert. It does make sense, of course, to have an Azure Search or Solar or something like this in a search service. You don't want to do this in SQL or Cosmos, but you have this freedom, especially in the cloud. Not saying it's a good idea, but at least you have the freedom to do so. So that that all comes down to the software design part of your microservices uh, solution, or yeah, your microservice solution. You of course can do this in, inside a monolith also, because uh, what I'm trying to say is you should design your monolith solution as you were wor working with a microservice solution. So inside your monolith, you have multiple modules not talking with each other. Uh, so you can leverage all of the power, all of the benefits of your microservice solution and the benefits of your monolith because monoliths are just easier to work with. And most of the time we don't need to do something else. Uh, we don't need to scale that much. 
Of course, in each and every module, you can also use different software design pattern, like for example, for your checkout module, checkout service, someone might decide we need an onion architecture for this. I don't know why you would want this for a checkout, but someone might uh, have read upon it and wants to use it. Well, you have this freedom if you're not sharing stuff between your modules, between your services. Of course, not sharing uh, code, not sharing stuff inside your solution does give a lot of duplicated code. A lot. And is this a bad thing? Well, it depends, of course. Because is it true duplication what you're introducing? Is it true duplication? Are you duplicating stuff which actually needs to change uh, with each other. Yeah, then it's through duplication and you probably want to share something via NuGet package or via whatever package management uh, system you have inside your, uh, the language of choice. So then you probably want to share something. If it's not through duplication, so uh, uh, the, the, the copy-pasted code can differ some, sometime in the future, if that's not a problem, then you should just duplicate it. Because what I've seen in the past in, in, a, in a well very old project, what we did is we had like 12 or 13 layers of abstraction and interfaces and base class and hooks you could override and inject stuff via enrichers, which was, well, <coughs> so abstract. The, the onboarding time on this project was like two to three months in order for some developer, be it junior or senior, to understand what was happening. One other downside of having so many abstractions is Visual Studio only is, well, this wide, or your monitor, and if you have so many tabs open, it's quite hard to navigate. So duplication is a bad th isn't a bad thing. What, what it helps you develop your software uh, in an easy to read fashion. And sure, if there is some bug in this software you need to fix, well, you have to fix it on all, of all places. Sure, that's true. But it, uh, the, the, the time it takes to fix this bug on all places, like say 20 places, is considerably less, in my experience, compared to having such an abstract solution uh, with, uh, and you only have to change it once somewhere because no one knows where we have to change it. Uh, so that takes some investigation time and in, in the investigation time you could have already fixed the bug in like 10 of the 10 duplicated uh, code files. So duplication is the bad thing of course. Uh, still you need to think when doing so. And what does this help you? Well, it helps you getting stuff done because that's what we're hired for. We're all hired to deliver business value and deliver it yesterday. So if you don't have such an abstract solution with a lot of intertwined, uh, well, calls, a lot of intertwined logic, uh, a lot of abstraction, you can get stuff done more easily compared to if you don't. So your product owners will be happy with it. And this goes for monoliths and microservices, of course. But microservices are hard, so you probably want to go monolith first, but design it like it was a mo microservice solution. So this is uh, design, and now, uh, this isn't Visio, of course, so I can show this to a customer. So what I did is, is uh, drew this in a Visio diagram and, and showed this to the customer, and we were happy with it. Or at least the, the fictional customer is happy with this. And now the fictional product owner uh, comes to me and saying, well, Jan, I'm happy with this, with this web shop we have, uh, be it a microservice or a monolith, Do don't, doesn't, don't care. Uh, but uh, people are checking out stuff, Infantry is uh, running, uh, running good and we have to scale up our Azure search because, well, people are searching a lot. Cool. 
Only downside is no one is paying for the stuff they check out. Well, of course, I said to this product owner, makes sense because nowhere in the specs was some payment service designed. But being a good architect like I am, I just designed a new payment service to this and I was done and the team could start working. So that's uh, how easy it is to extend functionality, just draw a box and some, some Azure functions and, and be done with it. If you, have, if you have designed your solution like this, like separate silos of functionality, separate functional domains. So if I had a big cluttered monolith or microservice solution like a sh shown in the previous diagram, I would probably have a lot of dependencies on different services, on different components, which I had to check if I want to introduce some kind of payment because there are probably a dozens of base classes and, and shared repositories I have to use and, well, a lot of difficult stuff. But now I don't, because if someone is checking out stuff, I'll just register to this event, this, yeah, this event, and then Azure Function will pick it up from whatever message bus you like. So that's all there is to it, just sending events if something has happened to a message bus and someone else some other service can pick it up if, uh, if the service wants to. So this was five minutes work. The team, uh, the team and I did some development on it and, and it was and it's done, well, uh, rather fast because we can just write a couple of uh, functions, call each other and, and store some state inside the database and be done with it. So the, the fictional product owner was happy, he got paid or at least the business got paid. <laughs> and we were happy because we delivered value within a days of time and could continue with the next service or the next thing we had to create. Some of you smart people might say, hey on, I, I just noticed you have some hard dependencies between these services, between these Azure functions inside your payment service. And you just told us that's a bad idea because you've shown us those, those burning flames inside the integration API, inside the, the processing API, and if this fails, this one will fail also. That's true. But that was, uh, that was, that's true for, for this solution, for this service, of course. But uh, what I was talking about is the overall solution of your, so well, solution design your solution architecture shouldn't have dependencies between services, between components. Whatever you do inside a service, well, as a solution architect, I don't actually care much about it. As a software architect, I would. I wouldn't want to have this in running in production if I was actually dependent between these services. But this is a, a software design. You could just as easily draw some classes uh, over here and well, the payment class is dependent upon the credit card bank or gift card uh, class. It's the same, just inside, inside a class library. So that's, that's a design decision you make when uh, having this, having this uh, overall design. But what the, uh, this com all comes down to is, is designing your uh, overall solution. And designing your overall solution is quite hard. Because it takes time. If you're doing it wrong, like we did in, 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 in the past, uh, de design was rather easy because we just had to draw some services and some lines between it and we're done with it. So we thought, oh, we're, we're good. This is easy. Implementation was harder because we had to build in some retrying logic, some circuit breakers, some, uh, we had to create all of our services idempotent because, well, otherwise things will fail very, very, uh, well, very, very bad. So uh, uh, if you do it correctly, the design part is hard and implementation should be easy because you just have to write, well, one, one big bulk of code which does stuff and then be done with it and go to the next project, to the next service. But before you start implementing stuff, 
you have to design your solution properly, which takes time, which takes a lot of thinking. What does this give you if you're designing it right? Well, you don't have to work with this strange correlation ID anymore, this strange lock group ID, because you're just working inside one big request, do your stuff, do everything your functional, well, uh, your, your business wants you to do, and it's one request, and be done with it. So you can throw away this, this log group ID, this correlation ID, and follow each and every single step which has happened inside this request, because you're still inside one logging group. Also, deployment is easy. If you deploy a checkout service, you know for a fact the search service, the inventory service, the payment service will never ever fail because if you're, ch if you're updating the, check uh, which was the checkout service. So you know, you, you know nothing will break or the checkout service might break, but that's because you did an, uh, an update to it which is failing for some reason, so you can just roll back. You know nothing else in my solution will break which is, well, good in my opinion, knowing nothing will break. What does this also give you is proper monitoring. What we have in, inside the solution I, I, I shown you earlier is if the integration API is failing for some reason or the business API is failing for some reason, we don't know for sure which other services are also failing because of this, because it's just one endpoint of this integration API failing for some reason. Is the whole integration API failing? So if, if that's true, well, we know now a lot of other services will fail also, and we know which ones. But that's, that's not something you want. If you only have, well, these, these, these couple of services doing their own little thing, you know for a fact, if the checkout service is failing, you know people can check out stuff at this moment, so you can, well, do something with it. And you also know people can still search your web shop, can still do some payments, and can still do all of the stuff, just not checking out. And that's how you want to design your monolith or microservice solution but go with monolith first because it's way, way easier. And if you need the scale, well, you can just pull out this little component which does something like checking out and pull it out and just set it uh, in a new app service somewhere or, well, app services Azure specific. So set it in Azure and work with the event bus you already have. Maybe you're working with an internal in-memory event bus, so you may, might have to abstract it away and, and to use service bus or event grid or something. But that's the only thing you need to do. So scale when necessary. And if you're designing your monolith right, the correct way, it's easy to go from monolith to microservice. Of course, there's this thing called pragmatism, and pragmatism is as a matter of fact, better as a perfect solution. So what I'm telling you now, you should split all of this stuff up. No service should have a shared database and, and everything is, is great. Rainbow and sunshine. Uh, still, we li live in an imperfect world and we have to be pragmatic about, uh, about it. So. If you see, I, I've spoken uh, with someone which also started on this route with having dozens and, well, they actually had like four or 500 services, each with their own little database, storing state and, and, and stuff like this. But they started to notice uh, of these uh, 400 services, there are about 300 services which needs your first name, last name and address. So this was replicated across 300 different services. Well, storage is, is cheap and, and the databases will be able to handle this, of course, but still it didn't feel right to, well, have, this, have, this, uh, have these names and this address information shared or, or replicated between different services. So what they did is store it inside a big, well, a big person database 
and create multiple views on it, and the views were named as the service they were uh, used for. So if I have a checkout service, they had a checkout view with the model the checkout uh, service wants to. So maybe a checkout service only wants the first name, last name. Sure, the view only had the first name, last name. What did this uh, give them? Well, only have one shared database with all of the pers person data. Uh, and having, well, 300 views for each and every single service. But this is safe-ish, because if the underlying uh, database model is changing for some reason, because changes happen, the views will stay the same, so nothing, probably nothing will break inside your service, unless the view is broken, of course, but that's a totally different uh, problem, and that's, that's the part of being pragmatic about it, or creating the perfect solution. So they could have continued with the perfect solution, having a lot of databases with person data, or going with a more pragmatic solution and, and store it all in one database. Choices. Uh, and that's, that's also our job, making those choices think. So that's about it for today. Um, if you want to contact me, well, my Twitter handle is here, but you can also contact me uh, via email or, or somewhere at GitHub or at my, at my website. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conference so far, and there are still a couple of awesome tracks uh, or awesome sessions uh, coming on later, so uh, you're free. Uh, thank you.